Hello gents. Um, having previously looked at the need for gaseous exchange, what we're going to focus on today is how this is important and different between aquatic and terrestrial organisms. We've previously identified the gases that need to be um, exchanged between organisms in the environment. Um, the important gases being carbon dioxide, which is required for plants in order to carry out photosynthesis. As we can see from the uh, word equation here, it's a way of plants creating the food that they require to survive, um, taking in this carbon dioxide gas. And then both animals and plants then need to carry out cellular respiration, which we see down the bottom here which is a way to take the energy that's in that food, whether it be in plants and produced by photosynthesis or in animals and consumed, and take the energy that's in that food and convert it into a useful form so that the cellular reactions that take place, all of those processes that happen in the cells, then have that energy in a form that they can use. So as well as these two gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide that are required, organisms also have waste gases that they produce. So the plants here we can see produce oxygen that they uh, can remove and also uh, both plants and animals produce waste carbon dioxide that they also need to exchange and remove um, after it has been produced. So in this video, we're going to go into a bit of detail about some of the specialized systems that organisms have in order to facilitate this gaseous exchange that they require. Um, small organisms, single celled organisms and very small organisms, they don't need a specialized system. They can just rely on simple diffusion in order to get the gases in that they require and to get the gases out that they produce as a waste. This is because when they are small, they have a large surface area compared to their volume. And this is illustrated in the uh, image here. So if we look at this small cube that we've got down here, um, six sides to it, let's say each, each of the lengths of the cube is one centimeter. So its surface is six faces or six centimeters cubed. And the volume, sorry, six centimeters, to squared and the volume is uh, one centimeter cubed, which gives an overall ratio of six to one. So just comparing the numbers, it means that the surface area is six times greater than the volume. This means it's got a very large surface area. And if it's got a large surface area, there's lots of surfaces, lots of places where gas can come in contact with the organism. As we go up, we measure the surface area and the volume of the, the larger cubes, we can see here the, the two centimeter by two centimeter cube has a surface area of 24 centimeters squared and eight centimeters cubed, which then when we put it into a ratio, it gives us a smaller ratio of three to one. So this means that its surface area isn't as large compared to its volume. And as we increase to the three centimeter cube here, we can see uh, 54 centimeters squared surface area 27 centimeters cubed volume, which gives a ratio of two to one. So this number here is twice this number here. So it's a much smaller surface area when you compare it to its volume. If you imagine the, the small cube, in order to get to the, the center of it, so if there are some cells in the middle, then there's a relatively short distance the, the gas has to travel when we have larger cubes and there are cells in the middle then this distance from the outside is much greater and so what we what we see is that larger organisms such as for example here they need to have a specialized system in order to get the gases into those cells so that the cells can have the, the gases that they require for the cellular processes. 
Okay, so the, the title was that we were going to look at um, gaseous exchange in both aquatic and terrestrial organisms. Just to make sure everybody's clear, this means uh, aquatic means that organisms live in water, and terrestrial means that organisms live on land. So there are two main differences or two main pressures that exist on organisms, whether they're in water or uh, whether they live on land. And these are the, in the water, the concentration of the gases is, is quite low compared to that of organisms in the air, um, simply because the amount of water that's there that's taking up the, the volume or the space, uh, there is uh, a lower concentration of gas. So there's less gas available for the organisms that are living in the water. So that's a challenge that they have to um, meet and the challenge they have to overcome in order to get sufficient gases in um, to supply their cellular requirements. Conversely, living on land, the problem for the organisms is that the gases are in the air and the gases in the air can't then get into the bloodstream of the organism until they have been dissolved into a liquid. So when the oxygen, um, let's take animals, humans for example, when the oxygen moves in, into the actual alveoli as we can see it here, it's still in a gaseous form. And before it can make this movement into the capillary, it needs to be dissolved into a liquid. And so what we often find is that there is a moist surface on the inside of the alveoli here, and other organisms have other adaptations, so that that oxygen can firstly dissolve into that moist surface and then move across into the blood of the capillary. But that's a challenge that different organisms have when they, uh, they are on land and oxygen is in a, in a gaseous form in the air. Okay, so let's focus on aquatic organisms firstly uh, and look at plants in aquatic environments. Um, many, many plants exist in aquatic environments and uh, the main adaptation that these underwater plants have is that their leaves are very, very thin. They've got a very, very thin leaf, uh, leaf surface, which means that they can get the carbon dioxide that they need for photosynthesis and the oxygen that they need for respiration from that water easily. These gases that are dissolved in the water and um, can move into the leaves by diffusion alone, because that leaf surface is really thin, it can easily then, those gases can easily reach the target cells where they are needed for those cellular processes. A bit like the idea that we discussed earlier of the surface area to volume ratio, having a really thin leaf surface um, facilitates that diffusion of those gases and makes it easy for those gases to get to the cells where they are needed. So the main group of animals that, um, that we're going to look at is uh, the fish that are involved in aquatic environments. And fish have um, gills in order to have, allow gaseous exchange to occur with, with the water. This really maximizes um, gaseous exchange between the fish and the water because the gills have a huge surface area. Um, gills are effectively more efficient than lungs because of the surface area they have and the blood supply that they have uh, flowing to, to them. Um, well, all the, fi the fish do when they're swimming in the water is that they gulp the water into their mouths and then this water passes through their mouths and across the surface of their gills. The gills then will take oxygen, which is dissolved in that water, out of the, uh, of the water and it will pass across into the blood that is flowing through the gills. The gills have a huge, rich supply of blood uh, in order to facilitate this diffusion and uh, get the required gases that they need and expel the waste gases that are produced. Okay, so now looking at terrestrial organisms or organisms on land. And firstly, the plants. Uh, the plants have the main, the main cells in the plants where the gases are required are the cells in the leaves. And so plants have got a number of adaptations to facilitate the um, transport the, of gas and the exchange of gas with the environment. So like the plants in water, the leaves are relatively thin, not as thin generally as the, the, the leaves that are found in plants in water, but still quite thin. And then 
In order to get the gases in, the plants have uh, these structures on the mainly on the undersurface of their leaves called stomata with the two guard cells either side of a hole which can open and close uh, in order to allow gases to diffuse in. Next then above the, 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 the bottom layer of the leaf you can see that in this layer here it's relatively um, loosely packed cells. There are gaps between the cells and this allows the gases that, that move in by diffusion to easily move around within the leaf and ultimately as far as carbon dioxide is concerned get to this layer of cells here which is called the palisade cells. The palisade cells are massively packed with the chloroplasts that are essential for photosynthesis. They're close to the top surface of the leaf so that uh, plenty of light can pass through to those cells and this is where almost all of the photosynthesis happens within the plants. And so it's an easy route for the um, carbon dioxide that is needed to diffuse in and get to those cells there. Those cells produce through photosynthesis the uh, waste gas of oxygen and similarly that oxygen then has got an easy passage through the spongy layer and out through the stomata uh, to, to return to the air. Insects on land also need a specialised system for a gaseous exchange um, mainly because they have a hard an exoskeleton which prevents uh, gas, gas exchange happening with, happening with the cells of the body. Um, they don't have a transport system like animals do, such as blood flowing through their body. And so they need to get the gases directly to the cells uh, that, are, that, re that are require those gases for their cellular processes. And so they've got a, a network of tubes that run through the body and just have holes that open up to the environment. The holes that open up are called spiracles. Um, these holes can actually be closed off by the, the insect um, with little valves, but essentially it's just an open passageway down a tube. The tubes that travel into the insects are called trachea, um, and these, this network of trachea and tracheoles um, directly supply uh, the gases to the cells that are required. Um, there are moist surface inside which helps to diffuse uh, the gas across into the cells um, uh, but it's a relatively simple system um, just increasing the surface area in contact uh, with the outside um, air so that the organisms can get the gases that they require and remove the gases that are produced as wastes. Okay, so lastly then we're going to look at animals uh, as terrestrial organisms um, and their gaseous exchange mechanisms. Um, animals have a system of lungs, which we've already described earlier, where um, air passes through the nasal cavity or the mouth when it's inhaled, uh, past the pharynx and, and the larynx and then down the trachea. Uh, once it gets to the trachea, it then splits into the two bronchi that take the passageway into the lungs. And then within the lungs, it keeps splitting and splitting and splitting into the bronchioles, eventually getting to the terminal end or the alveoli. This gives a massive surface area, a really, really huge surface area in contact with the air to get as, uh, as much gaseous exchange happening as possible and to make that as efficient as possible. Also, as we described earlier, those alveoli have a moist surface on the inside, which enable, allows the gas to dissolve firstly in there, and that makes diffusion into the blood uh, far more efficient. Within the lungs, of course, as well, there is a massive, massive network of blood capillaries to allow this gaseous exchange to happen between the alveoli and the blood. Um, so Many organisms, especially active organisms, um, need, need a lot of energy. Uh, birds and mammals, for an example, uh, are very active and they keep their body temperatures constant. And so they need large amounts of energy or they need to carry out lots of respiration. And so they need huge amounts of oxygen. And oxygen is relatively low in the atmosphere. And so if we just relied on simple diffusion and the lungs, it probably wouldn't supply sufficient oxygen to these organisms. However, these organisms have got a special adaptation, which is this protein here, which is called hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is found in the red blood cells uh, of these organisms. 
And hemoglobin, this protein, has a very high affinity or, or, or attraction for oxygen. And so it can, it can drag as much oxygen out of that air as possible and get it into the blood so that it can actually supply very high levels of oxygen to the cells of these organisms. Hemoglobin packaged inside the red blood cells can actually increase the blood's ability to carry oxygen by about 20 times, make it about 20 times more efficient. So this is a great adaptation these organisms have.